Tonight we're going to be talking about um, holiness as we had begun this morning. And as we talked about holiness this morning, we refer to it in the context of God calling us and summoning us to both come to Him and to be something that He expects of us to be. And as we talked about that, we mentioned some of the things that we are not to be engaging in, some things that we're supposed to avoid, and some of the, some of the mindsets that go into that. And that was to hopefully motivate us to consider that the things that may entangle us in this world should not because we have a soldier's mindset. And if we have the mindset that when something is tempting us, when something's trying to draw us in, that we could refuse that by simply saying, I've been called to a higher purpose. To know that there's something more meaningful that God has summoned me to do and to be. That there's a lot of sinful activities that we could probably avoid. That if there's a work to engage in, understanding that that is what I've been called to do. And because of that, understanding that it's a high and holy calling that I've been called to do that. Then that would be something that would be encouraging as well. Tonight I want us to look at it from the perspective of just who is our example. That when we think about holiness and, and, and really as I was thinking about this this week, considering is Jesus the one that we do we typically think of Jesus as being our example of holiness? I believe that we look at Jesus as being holy. We know that he is holy, and we're going to put up some passages that reaffirm that in just a moment. But is that who we're actually looking to as an example of, of holiness? And if we are, what does that mean? What should that look like? What, what exactly is he an example for us as it pertains to holiness? Those verses that were read for us tonight from Romans and 2 Corinthians both have a, a similar language in that they talk about God removing a veil. For the Corinthians, it's that veil that the Old Testament had put over the minds of many. For us, it is that veil that we have been separated from Jesus by over 2,000 years, and the image that we get may be distorted because we may not actually be engaged in the Word as much as we should. We may not be led by the Spirit as much as we should when it comes to reading and studying God's Word. You know, those things may be a hindrance to us, but we need to see clearly who Jesus is. But not only see Him clearly, but see Him clearly as if He's in a mirror and that we see our image there as well. And that we need to be able to see ourselves being steadily transformed into that image of Jesus Christ. That as we're looking at Him, we should be looking at ourselves as well. And that as we're looking at, at Him, we should see the same things in, in ourselves that we see in Him that we talked about in our Bible class this morning as well. And I would encourage you, if you uh, are in the side classes or something like that, to go back and to uh, listen to those Bible classes because it is really important to not only provide stillness and calmness within our souls, but to help us to understand what we're really created for to begin with. And that this morning we, we had a discussion about some of the big things that we might engage in. And for many of us, it's not necessarily difficult for us to not engage in those types of huge sins that we call them. But it's those everyday little small choices, those little small temptations that will often get to us. And that Jesus was so holy that even those small temptations he didn't give in to. And how can I become more like that? For me, it's not that, and, and Brad and I were having this discussion this morning, it's not that when I don't murder, I become more like Jesus. But it's when I don't hate or have animosity toward my brother that I become more like Jesus. Because when we look at Jesus' image, that's what we see. We see someone who was perfectly holy in every aspect, and he is meant to be our example. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. If you're ready for your three words, let's see the, the notebooks this evening. Ah, very cool. Looks like there's more and more notebooks. That's, that's really good to see. Hope, obedience, and grace. Hope, obedience, and grace. Because as we talk about looking at Jesus as an example, it's going to hopefully be challenging to us. It will probably be very convicting toward us as, to us as well. And, and it should be. Because when we look at Jesus and think of ourselves in comparison to him, it is easy to feel completely inadequate. Because we are. But there is hope. Where does that hope come from? When we think about obedience... Does obedience then make us worthy? Or when I'm obedient, is that, how does that work? How does that play its, its role in this? And, and grace. Obviously, grace is so very important because there's not enough obedience for us to become completely like Jesus in every aspect. 
We have to have God's grace along the way. So those are your three words, hope, obedience, and grace. First, let's, let's uh, reemphasize the point that Jesus is holy. Our theme for this year in taking time to be holy and thinking about holiness is really about this particular idea, is that we are looking to Jesus, beholding his holiness, and doing our absolute best to emulate that holiness in every aspect of our life. That's what it's about. And if we are able to emulate that holiness in our lives, it not only touches the lives of others, but it creates a stillness within us and a hope and a confidence that cannot be taken away. Jesus is in every respect holy because he is first and foremost God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is God. And because he is God, he is holy in every way. Every passage that you go through in the Old Testament that talks about the holiness, the righteousness, the glory, the splendor of God, Every one of those verses applies equally without any deviation whatsoever to Jesus Christ himself. Every passage, the, the thunderous voice that's described, that's louder than the seas, that shakes the mountains, it is equally applicable without deviation to Jesus Christ. Everything about the holiness, the angels in heaven gathered around the throne saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, equally and without deviation applies to Jesus Christ himself. And that's what dwelt among men. The word became flesh and dwelt among men. If we are able to emulate the way that Jesus Christ walked on this earth, that's the goal that we're talking about. Be holy as I am holy. If we can do that, that's our goal. That's what we're striving for. In Colossians 1, verses 15 and following, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have, and I love the word that's used, preeminence, that he is before everything, that he is made before every, he is there before anything that is made. He is the creator of all things. All things bow to him. There is nothing that is higher than him because he is God. In all things he has preeminence. That is the holiness that is our example. And this holiness slept beside 12 other sinful men for about three years as they didn't have a home to lay their heads in most nights and went around preaching and teaching and spent time with these 12 men who often argued about who was the greatest, who was the most important, who should sit at his left hand and his right hand, who dealt with the religious elite of the time and he was perfectly holy as he dealt with all of it. He is, was the one who was preeminent. Any power and authority that any of them had came because he created power and authority and delegated certain power and authority to men. He was above it all, and yet he subjected himself to all of it as well. We think about God's holiness, 1 John 3 and verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. That he was perfectly holy because he was perfectly sinless. No sin whatsoever. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 points it out as well. That for, him, uh, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Owing us nothing. And knowing that everything that we have done from the history of, our, of mankind itself has pointed to the need for Jesus Christ to give his life as a sacrifice for all of mankind, knowing full well that most people are going to reject it, and yet there's going to be those who are wanting to be conformed to the image of his son. He gladly gave up him, his life for them, and he did it that we might be redeemed. And he did it in such a fashion to remain perfect and steadfast. 
It is possible to not sin. And yet all of us have fallen short of it. And the one who knew no sin, holy as he was, was the one who was crucified because of the sins of others. Because that's what was required to pay the price for the sins of mankind. So, this is who we're supposed to copy. This is our example of holiness. How adequate do you feel in that? How are you measuring up? From last week to this week, from the things that we talked about in last week's lesson and the, the goals and the things that you thought about then, do you look more like Jesus today than you did back then? Will you look more like Jesus when you leave here than when you came in tonight? What am I doing to try to become more like Jesus as that example? Maybe the reason we have trouble in becoming more holy or with even the concept of holiness is maybe that we look to each other as an example. That we, we see a brother or sister who seems to be more holy than us. They, they seem to be living a, a more righteous life. And, and no doubt the scriptures say that we're supposed to look at each other for good examples of those who patience and continuance seek for glory and honor and, and immortality. That's, that's without dispute. But our example of holiness is Jesus. <clears throat> that is the ultimate goal. So how do we do that? Holiness is something that we have to see too. As lofty as a goal as it is, the Bible actually talks about holiness being a shareable attribute that we can have with God. That the verses that we've been using and talking about holiness, like 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us this, that His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It teaches us that we can become more like Jesus in that our nature has to change. And by that nature, it's not talking about how you were born. That's not the way in which the word is being used. But it's the way in which we have lived our lives that has become habitual to us. The nature that we have taken upon ourselves by the way in which we live can be changed. The way that I think, the way that I act, the way that I talk, the things that I do, the places that I go, all those things can be changed. But it takes an effort. But it also takes us looking at the promises that God has made that you can actually become more like Jesus. You can become partakers of that divine nature that he had. That you can love like Jesus loved. You can forgive like Jesus forgave. You can sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed. That seems almost impossible, and yet through these exceedingly great and precious promises that are given by glory and virtue, they've been given to us to tell us you can become godlike. It is a shareable attribute that God has seen fit to share with us to be like him. When you look at all the other so-called gods that have ever existed that people talk about, those gods share the attributes of men. They have wild lust, they have evil thoughts, they are malicious, they have all these, these evil attributes that come, they share them with man. They're, the gods become more like the men. Here we're told we're more like God. That this is something that he wants to share with us and has invited us to have it along with him. In Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image who created him. It tells us that we are created according to the image of him who created us. We are his workmanship, it tells us in Ephesians 2 and verse 10. We are God's beautiful creation. We have been put together and, and made in the image of Jesus Christ. In the very beginning, 
when God took the dust of the ground and he formed it into a human form, a human man, and then he breathed into that man the breath of life, he became a living soul created in the image of God, an immortal soul that was sinless, that was perfect, that was suited for everything that God needed him to do. Ecclesiastes tells us that everything in life is vanity. There's only one thing, really, that, that we're required that comes in two commandments. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's what we were created for. That is the whole duty of man, the reason for our existence, to fear God and keep His commandments. And over and over and over again, we fail in that mission. And so in Hebrews 11, verse 6, which is the New Testament equivalent to that passage in Ecclesiastes, for without faith it's impossible to please Him. Anyone who comes to God must believe that He is, fear God, and that He's a reward of those who diligently seek Him, keep His commandments. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed. And in all of that, whether it be Old Testament or New, God has always wanted His people to become more like Him, to return to what you were created to be. You belong to me. You are mine. Be like me. Imitate me. In Philippians 2, what is Jesus an example of? How can we share with Jesus? And what are some of those things? Philippians 2 gives us an idea. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Can you point to anything in Jesus' life that was about selfish amb ambition or conceit? But in lowliness of mind, how could a person ever take the lowliness of mind that Jesus did? Let each esteem others better than himself. Is that not what the cross was all about? Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, if it, if it must be drunk, then let me drink it. Your will be done and not mine. Look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the mind of Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but he made himself look he was not made to be he made himself of no reputation that it says he took the form of a bond servant he came in the likeness of man and then being found in the appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross Paul uses that passage that that we just read as that launching point for why it is that we're supposed to be working out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it is God who works in you both to do and to will for his good pleasure, verses 12 and 13 of that chapter. And he tells us that because of what Jesus did. What would my life look like? A am I transforming myself more into that? This is how I know whether or not I'm becoming more like Jesus. How am I doing with my own selfless interests? How am I doing when I'm thinking about, do I let and consider others more important than myself? How humble am I? How far am I willing to go? And how much am I willing to sacrifice for my God? That's how I know. Again, it's a high and lofty challenge and one that's not easy. In John 13, what about this one? Verses 14 and 15 on the night that Jesus is being betrayed. He takes a towel and kneels at the feet of his disciples with water and begins to wash their feet. And he tells them, if, tells them, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Is that the kind of servant I'm willing to be? This is how I know whether or not I'm becoming more like Jesus. Because it's, it's not just that he knelt down and washed their feet. He's about to go to the cross. He's dealing with the pain and agony of what's about to take place. But also knowing that these men are now going to be left to spread that message to all of mankind. Knowing that they're going to be martyred knowing that they're going to go through all kinds of hardships and difficulties. And though he has told them these things, they are at this particular time arguing about which one of them is the greatest. And Jesus still kneels down 
and washes their feet. Because he is still putting their interests ahead of his own. Because he is still at that moment when he needs to have some sympathy. When he needs to have some compassion. When he needs to be comforted. When he needs some strength. He still sees the need to wash their feet. Because he considers them more important that they understand this lesson. If I, being your teacher, have done this to you, then you ought to do it to one another. That's the example that he leaves for us. In, in places like Ephesians 4 and verse 32, how difficult is it to us to, for us to forgive? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. The example that's given to us of forgiveness is one that's amazing. That Jesus, even upon the cross, could look down upon people who are gambling for his clothing and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. To even have compassion upon them at a moment such as that is amazing. And yet, what do I find difficult to forgive? And how much of a grudge do I hold? 1 John 3 and verse 16, another one tells us, By this we know what love looks like. Because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Would I? Would I lay down my life for the brethren? Being transformed, the veil being lifted, seeing Jesus clearly, beholding as in a mirror, called according to this purpose to be conformed to the image of his son, to bear the same stamp, to look the same as what we see. It's a high and holy calling. But that's where we have to start. Again, when we've talked about holiness, that's what we've referred to it as, is not to look at it as being this is the end, that one day I hope to be there, which all that is true, but beginning with this is what I'm going to be. Not that I want to one day be. This is what I'm going to be because this is what I've been called to. This is what God expects of me. And this is what God helps me with. So how do we do that? I want us to look at 1 Peter. I thought uh, Peter's letter, 1 Peter, is a good place that contains a lot of information on how we can actually reach this goal. 1 Peter. We're going to start in chapter 1. Of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at verse 13. One of the first things that I think will help us is that we do indeed have to have hope. That it is actually possible. But it's going to come about through a changing of the way that we think about things. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 13 it says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He begins, it, it, we're beginning here in this chapter, to talk about this girding up the loins of your mind. This is the idea of a person who's going out to do work or probably the idea of going out to do battle. And that the, the clothing that they wore that would hang loose around them would get in the way of doing the work or engaging in the battle. So they would have to gird up their loins, these things that were hanging off of them, this, these loose garments that were there, so that they could effectively wage warfare without a hindrance. Here it says, gird up the loins of your mind. One of the things that, that hinders us so very much is our own minds, the things that go on in our own heads, the things that we are thinking about. Too often we're thinking what somebody else is thinking. And, and I'm thinking for you. I, I know what you're thinking. And I'm spending way too much mind in your head when I need to be tying up the loose ends in, in my own mind so I'm not hindered in doing this. And then he says that you rest your hope fully, not partially. Jesus, God, the church, being a Christian is not some emergency escape hatch to where we can, just in case there is a God, just in case there is a Jesus, just in case there is Judgment Day, I want to have all my bases covered, and so I want to be able to have you know, uh, an insurance policy that maybe I can get into heaven just in case he's real. It's rest your hope fully. Until we're able to do that, to rest my hope fully on Jesus Christ, then I will stop looking around for hope in other places. Those are some of the loose places of our minds that I think something else is going to be fulfilling. I think something else is going to be the, the escape that I need. It's going to be able to rescue me. 
But here it says, rest your hope fully on Jesus Christ. Completely, you put all of your weight there. He continues in verses 17 through 21. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges to, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Notice in those verses how it refers to those things that are of a spiritual matter and not a physical matter. Because too often we're resting our, our hope fully upon those things of the flesh. Those things that are of a material nature. But here he says, understand that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You are redeemed with incorruptible things. The reason I can rest my hope fully on Jesus Christ is because the foundation I have under my feet will not erode away. It will not vanish away. No man can crush it. No man can destroy it. No man can take it out from under my feet. It is there and it is solid. And it extends all the way into eternity. And nothing can change that. I can trust fully in Jesus Christ. That's where our hope stays at. That will tie up a lot of those loose ends that are in our minds. But obedience is also something that is not optional. It is absolutely required. In verse 14 of 1 Peter 1, it says this. Right after he says, rest your hope fully upon that grace, he says in verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. You changed your ways. You're different now. Your hope is on something else. And because of that, by necessity, it's going to cause a change of life. In verse 22, he says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Again, the reason for our conduct, the reason that we change is because our hope is on something else. And it becomes easier to obey now because I know that it has something that is truly rewarding and not half-hearted. In chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. In verse 8, after he talks about a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, he says, they stumble. Notice the difference between they and you in these next few verses. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed, but you or a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they, again they, when they speak against you, they are the ones that are supposed to be speaking evil against you. We're not to be speaking evil against one another. They speak evil of us. When they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. He makes a very distinct difference between those who are of the world and those who are Christ. And this is what makes us different from the world. 1 John 1, verses 6 through 9 teaches us that there is no darkness in God whatsoever, but if we're walking in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Notice that it says it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. As we are walking in the light, we have the guarantee that even though we still deal with sin, that we have an advocate with the Father. And we can go to Jesus and get forgiveness for those sins that we may commit because we are walking. That is our manner of life. We're resting our hope fully upon Jesus Christ. And because of that, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. What is holiness? Is it not the absence of, of unrighteousness? We can have this, but obedience is not something that's optional. And it is, brethren, only possible because of Jesus Christ. That is the only way. Back in 1 Peter, this time chapter 2, and starting at verse 20. How like Jesus am I? What credit is it when you are beaten for your faults if you take it patiently? 
But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Here's why. Because to this you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. We were reminded earlier, who committed no sin, there was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. Do we rest our hope fully upon the Lord? who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, notice the difference between he and we, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter makes it clear that it's only because of Jesus Christ. And here it doesn't even point to the cross, but it points to the stripes. The beatings, the persecution, the blood streaming down his back from the lictor's whips. Knowing that Jesus Christ took every lash because of our sins, and he did not revile. He didn't have animosity or hatred in his heart. That he was compassionate and kind and would have forgiven any and all of them. Because he did it for them. By his stripes we are healed. Is that who I am? 1 John 2 and verse 1, as I mentioned a moment ago, tells us that these things were written so that you might not sin. That's why they were written. That's why they're given to us. That's what God expects. They were written that you might not sin. But if you do sin, know this, you have an advocate. There's still hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. In our class this morning, we talked about Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, that because of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice, we can have great confidence and boldness in coming to the very throne of God and asking for that grace and mercy that we need to help us. But that's because of Jesus. It's not because of me. It's not because of a preacher. It's not because of an eldership. It's not because of deacons. It's not because of the members of a congregation. It's not because of your parents. It's not because of your children. It's not because of anything else in your life other than this. Jesus Christ. That is our example. That's who we're emulating. That's whose holiness we're looking to share. That's why we take the things that we do so seriously. That's why we, we try to not have any ambiguity when we talk about these things, to be perfectly honest with one another about where we're at, but where God says we can be. And God says, you come to my throne. You come to me and you ask for the help that you need. And you come with confidence knowing that I am going to answer. And I'm going to be able to answer you because of what I did for you so that you can become more like me. That is what our example is supposed to be about. And that's the only way that I know of that can actually be accomplished is, is through Jesus Christ. So tonight, though, the question I'm going to leave with you is this. Is, are you striving to imitate the, the holiness of Christ? Is it something that you see in the mirror and you're transforming yourself into that image daily? From glory to glory. That's what we're supposed to be striving for. If tonight you're not a Christian, know that being a Christian is, is the beginning. It's the start. And when you start that walk with God, it is a matter of transformation where you are created according to the image of him who created him. And that's where you begin. That if you are a Christian and you've been suffering, you've been having difficulties and you need help in becoming more like Christ, if there's something that we can do to help in any way whatsoever, please come as together we stand and sing and let it be known.